A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus, so that the death so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since then, we have the same spirit of faith. According to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We too believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and place us with you in his presence. Everything indeed is for you, so that the grace bestowed in abundance on more and more people may cause the thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. Verbum Domini.
chosen you from the world, says the Lord, to go and bear fruit that will last. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Dominus Vobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Gloria The mother of the sons of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons and did him homage, wishing to ask him for something. He said to her, What do you wish? She answered him, Command that these two sons of mine sit one at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus said in reply, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the chalice that I am going to drink? They said to him, We can. He replied, My chalice you will indeed drink, but to sit at my right or at my left this is not mine to give, but is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles loaded over them that the great ones make their authority over them felt. But it shall not be so among you. Rather, Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just so, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Verbum Domini Well, we welcome to EWTN in a special way this morning those who have traveled from their home states to attend the EWTN family celebration. And so we welcome all of you this morning to the sacred liturgy and we wish you safe travels back home to your destinations. Today we celebrate the universal feast of one of the 12 apostles. Hence the red vestments symbolic of the martyrdom of the apostles, and we celebrate specifically the apostle James, the brother of John, also known as James the Greater, to be differentiated from James the Less. Now, usually when the church fathers uh, designated two individuals of the same name, uh, apostles or non-apostles, one the greater, one the less, it was usually due to age. And so we can uh, uh, understand then that James the Greater, the brother of John, and we know John was, was younger in his own age, we can pretty much have it on solid authority from the fathers of the church that James the Greater was older than James the Less. But there's another point of differentiation, that is of stature. So it could be that James the Greater was larger in stature. Now whether that was horizontally or vertically, we're not sure but I think we're safer to assume uh, concerning his age. And of course, James the Greater and his younger brother John were known as the Sons of Thunder. And we have this one brief account from a life of a saint uh, text. Sons of Thunder was the name our Lord gave these two brothers, James and John. They were Galileans, typical of those energetic, religious, and often quick-tempered people. When the people of a Samaritan village refused to allow Jesus and his disciples to pass through, for example, these two brothers did not hesitate to suggest to the Lord calling down fire from heaven to consume the entire town. 
And their ideals were not always purely spiritual either. Their mother, Salome, very seriously asked our Lord to give her sons the first places in his kingdom. If they had faults, however, they were those of impetuosity and never mediocrity, because these two always seemed to want to give their all for our Lord. They had a tremendous capacity for love, and their gentle master was patient in teaching them the road to humility. Even when they joined their mother in expressing a desire to sit at his right and his left side, our Lord turned their desire for glory into proper paths. He told them that they did not understand what they requested and asked if they were able to drink of his chalice of suffering. They answered typically without hesitation and with great faith, we can, and did not dream that their hopes for a glorious Messiah would be dashed away in the terrible tragedy to come in the dead of night, and that their own destiny was to be one of pain and struggle. Nor did Christ forget his promise. James the Greater was the first of the apostles to suffer martyrdom, so a strong tradition holds, when Herod Agrippa killed him around the year 44. James was prominent enough to have served Herod Agrippa as the means of showing his favor to the Jews. Herod later condemned James, however, to death for openly proclaiming Jesus Christ to be God, thus hoping to appease the Jews who were plotting insurrection. And so we see the ill temperaments of the apostles in this brief account. You know, we know that Peter was very impetuous, but we also know that Peter was known to be a great leader, a great organizer, and Christ told him, you will lead the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. So all these uh, personality faux pas, huh? Our Lord can still use for greater good in leading his church. The three apostles, Peter, James, and John, were always mentioned first among the apostles. If they needed to be rebuked most often, they were also the closest to Christ. And I think that's an interesting point. If these were the three that were most often rebuked by our Lord, they were often the ones that were called mostly by him to be in his inner circle, not so much in a way of favoritism over the other nine, but to give to them certain mysteries of faith regarding the establishing of his church and placing in these three especially a greater task to lead the other nine. These three alone were admitted to be witnesses, for example, of his glorious transfiguration, and they alone were taken to the innermost recesses of the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of agony and of the arrest at the beginning of our Lord's Passion. James fully earned the name, then, of Son of Thunder. In his martyrdom, his voice became a thunderclap, we could say. His shrine at Compostela in Spain attracted pilgrims from all of Western Europe, and does so till this day. The body of this patron of Spain is said to have been transferred to Compostela in the Middle Ages, and this belief is supported by a papal bull of Pope Leo XIII from 1884. It may have taken James some time to understand the chalice which his master, Jesus Christ, offered him, but once he understood it, he accepted and drank of it deeply and fully. Again, the strong tradition that he was the first of the twelve to go through martyrdom. And so in the gospel that we just heard about these two brothers asking to partake of Jesus' chalice of suffering, although they didn't know necessarily at the beginning of this dialogue that that's what it would be, rather to sit in glory at his right and at his left, we see this desire, this great capacity of love for them wanting to follow our Lord, despite their temperaments, despite their faults, despite their pettiness, we see a great love and capacity of wanting to follow our Lord. Our Lord can take any fault, any fault, and transform it to a great good for his own glory. But you have to have the humility, I have to have the humility, 
to admit that fault exists and take it to prayer. Again, the theme of self-knowledge, a theme that I return to often in my homilies because it's so much a part of growing in the spiritual life. The necessity of self-knowledge. Jesus invites us not only to suffer in the pattern of his own death, but even to be crucified with him. Galatians chapter 2 and Philippians 3. Could not be accepting our own dying to self and uniting that with Jesus on the cross? Couldn't that dying to self be very simply acknowledging our faults? That we have ill temperaments, that we have things we have to work on, fear, shame, propensity to anger, a propensity to always have to be right, a propensity to always have to let my own view be known. Acknowledging these types of, of faux pas in our life, our personality, can't that be a dying to self? and giving it to our Lord. The troubled marriage, having both spouses take a real strong heart-to-heart uh, -heart look at self. Where am I wrong in this crumbling marriage? Where am I wrong in my consecrated religious life and my relationship with my fellow confreres? Where am I wrong in this ill relationship I have with my boss in the workplace? Where am I wrong in this ill relationship I have with this one particular co-worker? Where am I wrong in my relationship with the bishop, a diocesan priest might say? A bishop having the humility to say, where am I wrong in this particular instance? Could I be stronger in leading the church in this regard? I've gotten enough letters now from enough parishioners of area parishes within my diocese that this one particular abuse seems to be taking place in several parishes. Where am I wrong in not addressing it finally when the rubric says otherwise, that it needs to be done this way? Dying to self. Furthermore, through St. Paul, Jesus calls us to make the cross not only an occasional moment in our lives, but to continually, strong word, continually carry about in our bodies the dying of Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4, and to be constantly be delivered to death for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4 again, to continually carry about in our bodies the dying of Jesus and to constantly be delivered to death for Jesus' sake. One of our Franciscan brothers was just reminding me before Mass began that that scripture passage we have from the Gospels that says, take up your cross from Jesus' own lips. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He pointed out to me, this brother, that Jesus says in St. Luke's Gospel that we must take up the cross daily. It is only the evangelist Luke that points out the taking up of this cross daily. So again, daily, constantly, <laughs> continually. But because of our fallen human nature, we are often tempted to make our crosses as rare as possible. But Jesus wants our crosses to be right in front of us, not to lead us to despair, not to lead us to a despair of everything about our lives, both spiritually and temporally, no. But to accept that cross in union with his cross, which was a saving, redeeming act, Transform your cross by accepting it into a saving, redeeming act united with our Lord's own cross and transform it into a positive. 
when we not only take up the daily cross, again, Luke 9, but also continually and constantly live the cross, we paradoxically reveal in our bodies the life of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is a very, very telling chapter about the acceptance of suffering. I like to remind my hearers that it's not by accident that blessed John Paul II issued Salvifici Dolores on the saving aspect of suffering or the salvific aspect of suffering on the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes, February 11th. And of course, the shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes in France is known to be a shrine with its healing appeal, its healing miracles. Whenever a new document comes out from the Holy Father, whether it be an actual encyclical or whether it be an apostolic exhortation, one of the first things I do is go to the back of it to see what date it was universally promulgated. Because more often than not, there's a tie to that date to the subject of the encyclical or to the subject of the apostolic exhortation. And we see this with Salvifici Dolores, which you can download off the Vatican website or buy in pamphlet form, booklet form, at your local Catholic bookstore. This last week, we've heard the parables of Jesus. As a grain of wheat falls on the earth and dies, we bear much fruit when we bear our crosses heroically, in other words, dying to self. We also find joy as we share in Christ's sufferings, Colossians 1 and 1 Peter 4. We find joy in those sufferings. In joyful fruitfulness and thankfulness, then, strive to heroically live the cross. You know, when you read the lives of the saints, apostles or non-apostles, one thing you notice instantly, instantly, the cross was not absent from the lives of those who are canonized. In fact, the cross was very prominent in the lives of those who are canonized and blessed. This is why we canonize a saint based on their heroic virtue, because of how they lived while still on earth living. I like to ask people, you know, when you, when you witness either on EWTN or in person, because you happen to be in Rome, for example, a beautiful canonization mass held outdoors in St. Peter's Square with the big banner at, at the main center balcony hanging of the saint's uh, image. When you witness one of these great canonization masses, what is that? What's that saying? What's happening there? It's first and foremost a universal proclamation that this soul is now in heaven and the church is proclaiming it to be so, right? Wrong. <laughs> That's not what a canonization mass is about. The first, foremost, and primary truth about witnessing something as beautiful as a canonization mass is this, is that it's a universal proclamation by Holy Mother Church that while on earth, while on earth, this person lived virtue to a heroic degree, and they are now an example for us, modeled after Christ himself. That's what's first and foremost about a canonization mass. And now because of that, because of that primary point, now secondarily, Secondarily, Holy Mother Church proclaims their soul to be in heaven. And we have to remember that. Because the saints, like the Apostle James the Greater, had the cross in their lives and accepted it fully. God bless you.